yeah, I have all the, the highlighted ones and um, yeah. So whenever you're at, you, whenever you, uh, whenever you're ready, cool. let me know. And uh, yeah, the safety clip restock is happening. They should be here this week, so they should be online by this weekend. Whoever right. just asked that. So anyway, yeah, I'm ready when you are. Cool, cool. You guys, we got a lot of ground to cover. And um, if you guys have product specific questions, um, do send those to me in a message here. You guys can message me here directly on, on the side chat here, or you can send me a DM after. You guys, this, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Tom has like a full extensive, um, you know, more in-depth courses that he has as well. You know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, you guys. So I do recommend you do reach out to Tom. What's up, Lakota? Oh, there's your baby. Hi, Lakota. <laughs> oh, love it. So I think um, go ahead. What I was gonna what I was gonna say, Lorraine, is um, I think I'll just because people can't see the questions. So I think I'll just read them off like yes, storytelling please. and then I'll answer them. Please do. Please do. And um, by all means, you know, I sectioned them off into categories because I feel like that was easier. But by all means, if you feel like um, two are relevant to each other, go ahead and answer it that way. You guys, without a further ado, you know, um, I, I do, um, you know, we make this so that you guys get this interaction with Tom. Um, so I do appreciate everyone. If you guys need more context or any like a little bit of a follow up question, do ask it. But do know that we're trying to accommodate everyone's um, everyone's uh, questions that they want. So we got we got quite a list to, to go through. Um, but if if we see it fit and we if we get some time, we could probably have a little bit more of a discussion. This is a one hour session, you guys, and um, it's being recorded. So I'm gonna put it on doctor.com. I'm working on getting the other videos up. I'm sorry that it's been a delay, but um, we will get these videos up. And so if you guys need to reference this later on, it's gonna be on doctor.com. Anyways, you guys, without further ado, Tom Davis, here we cool. go. Cool, thank you. Uh, all right, so we're gonna just like like Lorraine said, I'm just gonna read off the questions because you guys won't know the answers I or the questions I have in front of me. So the first one is: Is should I allow my off-leash dog to greet other leash dogs in the dog park? Um, what is the best protocol for dog park interactions? How to introduce dogs to other dogs? So I've commented on this many times before. I have a video on dog parks in general. Um, um, it, I understand that there are dog parks out there um, that are suitable, that can be safe, and a lot of dogs um, do love them. And I always find that there's there's always going to be problematic situations in the future just because there's so many variables coming into one one situation. So you got a lot of dogs who don't know each other. You got some dogs. Th the reality is is if your dog goes there and has a great time and it's a good way for you to burn energy, I understand that that's great. Um, <clears throat> but there's always like the devil's advocate. I also understand that if you live in a huge city like Manhattan or Brooklyn or Atlanta or somewhere that um, there is no off leash space and the dog park is the only way to exert energy. I understand that too. So um, I'll, I'll answer this question as it is. Uh, should I allow my off leash dog to greet leash dogs out in the park? I think it's gonna be really discretionary on your particular dog. As you guys know, there's gonna be a lot of dogs that are going to be leash reactive. They can be leash reactive. Um, the leash in general creates frustration. So think about basically all of your friends running around playing in recess as you are tethered and tied back to something. Um, so you have to be very mindful that the leash can cause a lot of problems not only with your dog, but with other dogs too, because they can get kind of upset that your dog is leashed too. So should I allow my off-leash dog to greet other leash dogs in the dog park? I would say no, just as a responsibility thing. I don't think it's appropriate and fair. If your dog is off-leash, like when, my, when Lakota, for an example, is off-leash, I never, ever, ever, ever let her go to up to any other person and any other dog because there's two things. There's, there's some sort of a responsibility and protocol that you have to have uh, as an as a off-leash dog owner, if you will. Um, very few people can actually control their dog off-leash. And if you're one of those people, I, I would highly suggest advocating for the fact that your dog is running around off-leash. Don't let your dog go and do rude stuff, basically. So I would say no. Um, the best protocol for dog park interactions 
and I, and it's hard to answer because I don't know the context of this question. If you're walking in Central Park in the morning and there's tons of off-leash dogs um, or whatever, but I typically tell people like, if you're going to have your dogs off-leash, like let them go and enjoy nature instead of trying to find a bunch of other dogs to play with. Um, but the best protocol for dog park interactions is, is very binary. You're either going to be a dog park person and you just have to trust and just good luck everybody. And hopefully it works out. Um, but there's, once you enter that ring, it's a free for all. It's kind of like WrestleMania. Um, once you step foot into that ring, the other dogs that are coming from all over the place, aren't going to have any yield to your dog's, um, insecurities or your dog's uh, vulnerabilities of like, wait a minute, my dog's new, my dog may not do good. And that's kind of the problem sometimes that you find in dog parks is, when you enter a, an arena where there's a bunch of off-leash dogs doing their own thing, you, you have to immediately hit the ground running. So there's some dogs who even come into our daycare that don't do well, even though they're friendly dogs, having 30 to 40 other dogs running around playing rough is not their cup of tea. So I would just say there is no really good protocol for leash dogs in dog parks because it can create a lot of problems. Um, so that's how I would say Inter introducing other dogs is an entirely different thing. It's like a whole different conversation when you're introducing dogs in context of my neighbor's dog is walking down the road. They seem like they want to be friendly and neat. That's a whole other entirely different ballpark than having your dog on or off leash surrounded by a bunch of variables that you can't control on and off leash. Um, so that's kind of that. Uh, introducing a new dog to an existing family dog. And again, I know that the, I guess the category of this, uh, <clears throat> this Zoom is socialization. So um, introducing a new dog to an existing family dog. The best thing to do is if it's, if it's a puppy, you have a really great opportunity as long as the dogs in your house are friendly to just go in, um, in my opinion anyway. I mean, if you get just a nine, eight week old puppy that is just a puppy, and you get a bunch of other dogs that are balanced, happy. They've never had a problem with other dogs. The only thing that I would say uh, is to remove dog dishes, uh, dog bowls, dog toys, bones, anything that's going to be high value. I would remove those things because you have to advocate for not only your dogs that are living at the house, but you also have to have to advocate for the uh, ignorance that the puppy's going to have. Puppy comes in, sees a bone for the first time puppy's not going to have any regard to whose that is, where it's laying or who, who it belongs to. They're going to smell it. They're going to run to it. They're going to find it. And of course that can cause problems um, in the future. So I would just say, if it is a puppy and you're bringing it in and your dogs are friendly, you're not really worried about that. The only thing that I would do is remove everything from the actual, um, from the actual house that can cause uh, any. Tom, do you recommend separate feeding times in that case? Yeah, well, I, I was gonna get into if if it's a puppy, yes, I I would always I wouldn't recommend like free feeding, um, just because the puppy is going to get into puppies will never stop eating. I mean, they're like vacuums; they'll eat until they're sick or they're this big. So, what I would recommend is having that uh, having that dog, you know, eat in a crate or an X pen or whatever. But yeah, definitely separating the. Uh, um, the, the dog's food when you eat, because puppies, again, don't have any idea about space, personal space and, and things like that. Yeah. Now, if it's, if it's a new dog and it's like an adopted dog or a foster dog or whatever, and it's a dog that isn't a eight to nine week old puppy, what I suggest is always meeting on neutral grounds. So don't just throw the dog into your backyard. Don't just throw the dog into your house. What I would suggest is bring your dog into neutral ground. So go to the park, go down the road, um, go somewhere that isn't possessive of, of certain things. And is it going to make, cause you got to think like you've been waiting for this adopted dog for weeks or months or whatever. Your dog has no idea what that is. Your dog just thinks presumably that it's just a dog off the street that just wandered into your house. They don't know that it's now part of their family. So you're going to have to really tread lightly with that when you get uh, an adult dog meeting your pre-existing family by your dogs. That's what I mean. Um, so I would have them meet on neutral grounds on leash going for a walk together. So this kind of plays, this kind of plays into part with uh, the first thing that we talked about, about introducing new dogs as you kind of have this leash dog, leash dog going for a walk. 
together. Um, and then you kind of do this and then you put one in front of the other and then you put the other in front of the other. And that this is really discretionary on what the behaviors they're showing you. So if you, if you have a dog that is like, and you'll be, you guys will be able to tell by behavior. I mean, if they're sitting there and they're play bowing and they're having a good time, you could probably have them meet. But I think that this is more geared towards what if we're not sure what's going to happen, go out for a walk together, do structure. You can use an X pen or you can use a, um, a, a, uh, what's it called? A chain link fence to get them to meet safely before you actually let them go face to face. So that's kind of like a, what, what do they do on the after, like the living situation of like the sleeping mm. quarters for the dogs? Do you, do you recommend that they, they, they buy a, a separate kennel so that way the two dogs are kenneled separately or next to each other, separate rooms? It really just depends on the, the dogs. It really, really, really does. There's no like textbook of like, because you'll get some dogs that literally have absolutely just zero cares that that new dog is in their house. Yeah. Or you'll get that dog that is constantly just playing with the other dog. So it's, it's really discretionary. But I think if the, and I think the question is probably like, if I have a dog that's unsure or maybe have an older dog that could be grumpy, um, the, the puppy, you're, you're always going to, I think, advocate for both ends of the spectrum. So yeah, if they're eating, they should be probably separated. Um, at night, the puppy's going to be wanting to running around. The puppy's probably going to be crated anyway. Um, so you can separate them during times. Um, there's, there's no problem with that, but it, I think it, it depends on the age of the dog. It depends on the, um, the breed of the dog it depends on how the other dogs are in the house. It depends on how many dogs are in the house. It depends on how much training you have with the dogs that are existing in the house. Cause in a perfect world, it would be, um, everybody's friendly, they get along and they sleep together and they're off to the races, but I just don't know the context of what's going on. So it's a really vague question. Um, but that's, I think the real question is, is it's either a puppy or it's not. And if it's not a puppy, meet them on neutral grounds, get them to know each other outside of the house or outside of the property. Even the backyard is going to be, could be kind of territorial and weird for some dogs. So having them meet off the property and then bringing them to the property and kind of seeing how it goes. Yeah. I would say separation when they are, when they're eating for the first couple of weeks, maybe a week. Um, and then as well as just start working on some kenneling to get them structured. Yeah. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so how to play nice with other dogs and what to do in situations where they're being aggressive. Do you immediately remove them and leave? Um, is this, is this, okay, this is probably just in pertains of like play in general, I would assume. Correct. Um, and someone asked um, in the audience of specific, can you train, and it kind of has to do with this too. Um, can you train a dog that plays rough to be more gentle and polite with other dogs? And then someone, Erica has dogs that like to play like lions in the backyard. Um, that could be a little bit rough for other dogs that are not used to that sort of play. So I guess, um, it's a, it's a tough question because, you know, it sounds like there's some, you know, natural instincts going on there, but I guess addressing that, um, how, how would they address that? Yeah, I think, I think the best way to answer this is what I would do with my dogs. Um, so dogs are very naturally, when I say aggressive, I don't mean in a, in a behavioral sense of mean, I mean, like football players are aggressive. Uh, uh, toddlers are aggressive. Dogs are naturally, you know, clamping onto each other, ripping each other around. Their tails are whacking all over the place. They're running into things. They're hitting their head. They're very like just playful and, and, and bulky and, and kind of aggressive in that sense. And that, so if you get two dogs that are playing, um, it, it, you really have to, I've seen dogs that are being very playful, that play rough, that people are really nervous about and they separate them when really they're just vocalizing and they're playing. Um, so if they become too aggressive, you just have to, you have to really understand and audit what aggression is. Like if they're becoming aggressive, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're playing too rough for your liking? Does aggressive mean that they are um, getting too aggressive in the house where they're knocking candles off the wall or whatever? I mean, the aggression, do you immediately remove them? It really just depends on what's happening. If you, if you're 
if you're if the question is is are they becoming aggressive to a point where they're actually getting upset with each other then yes you can you can remove them because maybe the it's just like advocating for 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 siblings right you get brother and sister brother and brother whatever and they start playing and then they become upset with each other because one stole this and the other one you know got the upper hand or whatever and then they start kind of having more of an argument with each other and it becomes a little more than just playing so you really just have to audit and decipher between what is aggressive and what's not because that's like that's the most important thing i would say is just trying to figure out what that aggression is but again it's a very vague question on if two dogs are playing what is aggression in your opinion so um if they're becoming mean to each other and they're picking on each other yes you can remove them but they're probably just going to go right back at it um, so that's, again, one of those questions that it really, really, really depends in the context of what's happening with the dogs. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then I think, uh, I believe it was Alicia who asked that I, at least our Alice, Alice, I hope that was enough information on that. Um, do let us know if you have additional like uh, examples or something of what's going on, uh, with your dogs, uh, rough housing. Um, or whether it's, you know, your dog maybe starts playing nice, but then always leads into, you know, really getting yeah. after that. Um, so let us know a little bit on that. And then I think then it, it, this is a good segue into the next topic, which is um, aggressive dogs and dogs who actually have gotten into a fight or, or bite other dogs. Yeah. So dogs attacked by by another dog because the dog sniffed or how to overcome this incident and how the dog is ready to go back to interact with other dogs again. Um, well, so a couple of things is again, I, I would, er it's hard for me because, and I guess, I don't know, maybe you should take my advice. Maybe you shouldn't, I, it's hard to say, but I, for me, because I work with so many dogs and, and, and not only that, but I hear, I have so much information from dog owners because that's all that I do is, and not only me, but just even if I'm doing an email, I can hear it with my clients and my other trainers is we get so much information in from what's going on out there. Um, I, I, we, you know, so all, all of these different scenarios and this dog did this and my neighborhood set up this way and blah, blah, blah. And I can tell you that, I mean, the reality is, is your dog is your dog. And, and I would highly just suggest to people that if you don't know that other dog for sure, and you're with your dog, I would just stay isolated. I, I wouldn't, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't go around other dogs. And I know that some people can't really get through places without seeing other dogs. But if you're to a point in this question where your dog is sniffing another dog that they don't know, you're flipping a coin and you're exposing your dog to potential failure. And I know that, and again, I know that as a dog owner, you're like, what do you mean? I'm out for a walk and a dog sniffs my dog. What's the big deal? But as somebody who's professionally worked with dogs, I can tell you that you're, you're, you're taking a risk by just letting a random dog meet your dog. If you're out for a walk and you pat, you cross paths and you spend enough time having the dogs cross each other's paths so they can sniff each other. Again, you're flipping the coin to figure out you have a 50, 50 chance. It's either going to go good and they're going to keep walking or it's not going to go good. And there could be a potential dog fight. So for me, I just think in general across the board, I would recommend that if you're not in an area where you know the dogs that are around and your dog has buddies in the neighborhood or whatever, you keep your dog to yourself because even if you have the most friendliest dog in the entire world, you have to realize that that behavior and that personality of the dog can be taken away from them and they can become like this. So I think I'm just getting down to the core of in general in the future and I know that it's hard because dog owners are like, what's the big deal? It's just the dog. Dogs are friendly. They're not always. You don't, sometimes people who handle their dogs have absolutely no idea what they have at the end of the leash. And so when they're out with their dogs, they don't really know what they have. They don't know if it's an intact male that's developing maturity. They don't know if the dog is showing their teeth because they're not paying attention. They just think because their dog is friendly to them and they're humans in their house, or maybe their dogs in their house, they're friendly to everybody. So I think just in general for everybody that's listening to this now and in the future to avoid conflict and to avoid these types of situations happening, because I can't tell you how many times my dog got attacked, my dog got attacked, my dog got attacked, my dog got attacked. They're getting attacked because you're exposing them and giving other dogs an opportunity to potentially attack them. So if you're out in public, I would just say, keep your dogs to yourself, not 
not because you don't, you don't, you don't want to be social. There's a big difference between having your dog being social with other dogs and your dog just going up to let every single dog meet them out on their walk. Um, but to overcome the incident in the future is just avoid it. And, and I know that that maybe doesn't sound like something that's sustainable, but to be honest with you, if you're out and you're letting every single dog you see meet your dog, you're flipping a coin, literally every encounter. Um, and there's only going to be a matter of time before they give each other the look or the other dog, whatever, and attacks your dog. Um, and that's like the big problem with dogs being off leash and people saying like, Hey, it's okay. They're friendly. And you're like, mine's not. Um, but to get over this, what you can do is you have to, it's kind of like, it's kind of like children. Like if your dog is your child, if you will, um, you're not just going to let your kid play with every single kid that they see and they meet if they're at the airport, they're at the mall. Um, or even at school, there's certain, there's certain kids that there are their age and there's certain kids that are their personality that, that maybe they're going to do better with and not, you get two puppies that are running around gangbusters versus an older dog that maybe is, is aggressive or reactive or whatever. Um, so I think just finding the right dog for your dog to be, um, to be acquainted with would be a good idea, but I would say just in general, don't, don't meet every dog you're out on a walk with. I think dog owners feel like they have an obligation to think that if their dog's friendly, let's just flip a coin and try it and see what happens. And that's, that's really not a good idea to do regardless of how friendly your dog is, because it only takes one incident for that innocence and that really happy go lucky, cocky kind of confident behavior to be stripped from them because another dog attacked them. And I've even seen that with my own personal dogs, in the past where I've been doing demos and equipment failures happen and they've gotten, you know, bitten or attacked. And then they have a hard time getting over uh, issues with, with, with other situations like that in the future. So to desensitize the process, I would just teach your dog that um, because you can start to develop um, the dog can start to develop insecurities around other dogs because now they don't trust other dogs. So then you have to go through the whole process of desensitization but I think long-term, what the question is, is how do I introduce my dogs to other dogs that aren't going to attack my dog? And I would just find dogs that you know that are friendly or on the same page as your dog. Some dogs just don't play well because they're completely on two different worlds um, that are neutral, things like that. So you really just have to find almost a playmate for your dog. And a lot of times that doesn't come from random dogs you see in the streets that you don't know. So um, rather that's meeting a friend or a family member or a neighbor or just a dog that you see on your walk. I mean, everybody w just lives in so many different walks of life from, again, like downtown Manhattan all the way to being out in the middle of the country. So I think it just um, pick your battles with the dogs that you feel like are going to be beneficial for you and your dog. But I think just in general, getting over the hump of your dog doesn't have to be friends with every dog that you see. And that's OK. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. So the next category is identifying behavior change and how to be proactive. So do you have any ways of identifying when a dog is going to be aggressive before it happens? <clears throat> I, I, and I think this question is probably geared towards, do you, are there any types of um, <clears throat> behavior that you would see um, from a dog before they maybe get into a fight with another dog. Because again, aggressive behavior is something that can be categorized as rough playing or maybe mean on the leash, who knows. But um, dog behavior, things that you're looking for is stiffness and stillness. Um, so a dog that is really stiff and still and really doesn't like to move around another dog is really on edge. And it only takes a quick sudden move to detonate that dog's potential risk of exploding. Um, to another dog. So you have to be really careful about that. Um, the hackles that come up, a lot of people like automatically assume that the dog is immediately going to be aggressive. And that doesn't always mean that the hackles just kind of are this involuntary thing that some dogs do when they feel uncomfortable or unsure. My dogs will get their hackles up when maybe they meet another dog that I know that they're going to like, and they end up liking, but they're a little unsure in the beginning. Um, so you're going to be looking for the stiffness and the stillness and really just this locked in thing. You'll get dogs that are really locked in and kind of licking their lips and they're very 
dialed into something. So those are the types of things that you're going to be looking for. But and it doesn't always have anything that a lot of people also think that the tail wagging or not wagging um, means that they're aggressive or not. And the tail does definitely show signs of behavior and what the dog is feeling like an antenna. But it doesn't mean that if the dog's tail is wagging, then that means they're happy or they're they're okay with things. Um, on the contrary, of that, dogs who are attacking and being violent can also wag their tail the entire time. So I think that that's a big misunderstanding in the dog world. Um, Tom, um, I do have a follow up to that one. Uh, yeah. And people are asking if in those situations, what if they have an e collar? Should they use the e collar? when the dog is either already in a fight or looks like he's about to, you know, wants to get a little aggressive on another dog, the use of an e-collar in that situation. Got it. Got it. Um, typically the answer is typically no. Um, and the reason that is, is because when you get dogs that are going to, I call it like I was, I was doing the, I did this seminar in Brooklyn and I did this demonstration where dogs will get like this wild west stare down where they're sitting there and it's like da -da -da, da -da -da, right and they're sitting there and they kind of have this like this stare down hockey fight type thing where they're like waiting to drop gloves and then all it takes is the detonation from anything you could poke the dog you can say something and you can see it where and it's the same thing when dogs are playful so if you get two dogs that are kind of like sitting there like this and they're like getting ready to play and they're kind of looking to the side and they're getting ready to pounce on something like a cat. Um, it, any type of detonation uh, or any type of like quick movements could detonate the dog to explode. So if you're getting dog, so I, I say, I say no in general. Um, are there circumstances like today I worked with a pit bull that had this prey driven locked in very like, I'm going to like, you know, do something. I don't really care what the intentions are, but this on the leash then leads to reaction. I knew that the dogs weren't going to actually get close enough to do anything. So in cases where the dogs are far away and they're building, like in this case, I used the 280C vibrate to um, basically decrease the build and or avoid the, the reaction. So the dog was locked in brrr, with the vibrate on the pager, the dog snapped out of it, reclused away, and then had an opportunity to think clearly. So I would say if they're right next to each other and they're sitting there like trying to figure out who's going to jump on each other first, the e-collar will just detonate your dog to, ex to detonate, to explode. Um, if they're, if they're further away and you start to see building, um, in general to like the e-collar questions, you can certainly use it for obedient counter conditioning, uh, re, you know, excluding the dog out maybe with like a recall or just using the correction to say, leave it. But you don't really want to have, you don't really want to correct your dog in situations like that. If they don't know contextually, like why they're getting corrected, because then you could start associating potentially that other dog with, um, the, the, the negative experience, which I talk about often because, um, you know, there are, there are certain scenarios where a lot of people think that if you correct a dog that is reacting, then they're going to associate that correction generally with what they're reacting to. And that's not really the case. So markers, cues, uh, and clarity is really important when you're working with these types of situations. But if the question is, should you use it right when they're getting ready to go after each other, especially if they're close, I would say no. So it's better for you to either like if they're on a leash to physically get them out of that scenario, or if they're not on a leash, grab them by the collar and pull them out. How would you get the dog kind of like out of that scenario? Yeah. Well, again, it, it really, and I know that this is annoying probably for people because people just want me to give them um, exact answers. And it's just irresponsible for me to give people exact answers. Cause if there's 50 people in here and I tell one person, yes, it's like this for them the 30th person is then going to turn around and try it on their dog. And it's going to be completely out of context of what I was saying. So I have to be careful. Totally. Um, no, and I actually yeah. appreciate that you, 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 I do appreciate that disclaimer, Tom, because, you know, um, sometimes in these conversations, someone will reference one story right. that came from one customer or one person, and maybe you gave an answer to, to that person's particular dog, particular situation. 
but then all of a right. sudden it didn't apply to them. So yeah, do you got you guys with this information? Tom is a professional trainer, but use it because every like he says, every dog is different, every situation is different. And there's only so much we, we're trying to get through all the questions, but there's only so much information that we have to be able to give him for the context. So we're trying, you know, giving answers yeah. broad, uh, just like a broad answer. Um, obviously use it to your discretion, everyone. Yeah, and that's why I try to answer it on twofold is like, should I use the e-collar correction when a dog's about to jump on another dog? No, if they're right next to each other. Yes, you could use it if they're further away to um, decrease the build and or remove the dog from the, the build, yes. but. Um, but I would just say like in general, if they're off leash, I mean, there's so many, there, there are so many questions that like I would have if somebody were to say, my dog's about to go after another dog, what should I do? No idea because it's like, they're, what's going on? Like, what's the situation? Um, but generally speaking, like, you know, have it, again, I think going back to originally what I was saying before, if you're going to have your dog off leash, there's two things that you really need to keep in mind is A, um, you should really make sure that you've proofed uh, your dog's recall to make sure that if you do see another dog, regardless of how friendly or not friendly your dog is, that's potential risk, 50-50 chance there's going to be a bloody, gruesome blood bath of a fight, and you just don't want to take that chance. And I know that it's like dramatic, but trust me, like I, you know, if I, if, if in the dog world, I would be the, you know, the ER doctor that sees all the crazy stuff that people, you wouldn't think it, or you wouldn't believe it, or you'd never guess that's, we don't get dogs that come in that are like, my dog's perfect. Nothing's bad ever happened. Take my money and train. It's this has happened with my dog. I have all these bad experiences or I've had these really crazy experiences. I need help. So I just want you to just remember that I'm always playing devil's advocate here. So having a good recall with your dog off leash is number one. And also just making sure of your surroundings with your dog. Um, if you're going to a public place and your dog is off leash, which I do sometimes, and I don't always have the friendliest dogs, but I'll never let a dog off leash that I can't control on a dime. Like I, I will never let a dog off leash that I would think in my head that would ever not listen to me if there was another dog or another person. So I think just in general, control is really big. So, um, yeah. 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 All right, I'm gonna move on uh, to the next one, which is if a dog breaks a heel without my command, only to socialize with another dog, which would mean if I'm out on a walk and I ask my dog to heal and they break it to go see another dog, should I still correct my dog? Yes, because they broke the heel, which if you don't correct the heel, it'll dilute your, it'll dilute everything, which basically means I want you to do this behavior. The dog says, okay. And again, in context of, you're going to ask your dog this behavior because they know it, not because you're trying to teach them this. Because obviously, if you're teaching a dog heel for the first time and there's other dogs around, epic fail anyway. So make sure that when you're walking with your dog and they're in a heel, which means left side loose leash, uh, and then they, they say, hey, there's my buddy, bang, and then they go see another dog. Yes, you're correcting that behavior because you've said, hey, I want you to do this. They said, I'd, I'd rather not. There's something more distracting. So yes, you're going to correct your dog for that. The owner isn't necessarily mad that the dog is socializing, but how do they let the dog know they should only be when the dog gives them okay? Very good question. I have a, this is, this is a, now this is a more, uh, this is right up my alley because this is a more like exact question and I can answer this exactly. So if your dog is in a heel and you've asked them to do this and they decide to say, I'm out because there's a squirrel, bird, dog, or whatever. You're going to correct them and say, what gives? I just asked you to heal. Because the reason why we heal for two main reasons is because we don't want to be dragged down the road or the trail or whatever with our dogs, or you're bringing in mail. doesn't matter. Heal is walk nicely. Thank you very much. And then we also want to keep them engaged with us because th the real world is going to offer a bunch of crazy environments for us. So when I say heal, that means I don't want you to lick up something on the ground. I don't want you to interact with other dogs. I, I don't want you to take treats and cookies from random people on the road or whatever. Um, so anyway, yes, you're going to correct that dog. And the biggest difference is your obedience. So your dog broke the heel because your obedience wasn't good enough. And you don't. And I think the, the next question is, is how, well, then how do I when is it appropriate to then let my dog go and meet another dog or let my dog go and sniff the roses or 
um, go potty or whatever. And that's the, the difference between heal and break. And that's what I talk about. Break, there's my three main commands include break. The break command is making sure that your dog understands if you're going to ask them to do something, you also need a behavior or a cue to tell them that they do not have to work anymore. So like with Lakota, if I tell her to heal, and if you guys have ever seen Lakota work, she's very intense. She's ready to go. She's like a loaded gun, locked and loaded. She's working with me. And then the moment I say break, she's out, she's gone. She literally is, is her, her break command is so binary and black and white that when she's working, she knows she has to work and that's what she has to do. That's her job. And her break command is also uh, extremely clear. So if your dog is constantly um, breaking the heel, that's because you're probably not set up well enough to, to do heel around distractions would be my guess. And the other thing is, is when is it okay for those things to happen and how do you do it? You have to introduce the break command and you're not going to do either of these things in a realistic environment. You're always going to develop these things first, meaning if your dog doesn't know heal and break well, do not go outside and expect them to do it with distractions. You're going to fail. Um, but I also know that, hey, listen, um, I live in a place where I can't get away from people. I can't get away from Main Street. I can't get away from distraction. That's okay. Tell your dog to break. Even if they don't know it that well, give them the cue on you. You go to your front door, Fido sit, the dog sits. You look outside, it's five o'clock. Everybody's outside with their flexies. You say break, and then you break the dog. So you're giving the dog an opportunity to be successful on your terms and not theirs. But if you go outside and you say, my dog doesn't know heal that well, I know we're probably going to fail out here. And you're heal, 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 heal. You're diluting your entire relationship. That's, that's, that's really not what you want to do. Um, so it's kind of like walking past the batting cages as you're learning how to play baseball instead of just jumping into them. You just say, break, okay, I don't know this yet. I'm just going to break. Um, and then maybe find some times to, to do incremental heel patterns uh, while you're outside. Nice. Um, we do have a kind of a little bit of a follow-up um, from Jakey. He's asking in regards, or he or she is asking in regards to this topic, um, how many corrections is too many corrections? If I correct and nothing changes, what should I do next? Ooh, um, good question. Um, I would say it really, really comes down to, again, here's, okay, here's the question I'm hearing, just, just to let you know where my brain is at with this. My dog is out and I'm constantly correcting my dog. Okay, so two things come into play here. First thing is, is does your dog actually know the, it, this kind of ties in with that, right? Does your dog know the behavior? Maybe, maybe not. And you really have to make sure that you're, you really know if your dog knows that behavior or not. Oftentimes people will go out and ask their dogs to do things that they know very little in a very distracted environment, which is, which creates a lot of frustration. So I would say the dog probably doesn't know the behaviors well enough to be using, trying to apply these things in, a, in, in that environment. And then the other thing is, is it just depends on what equipment you're using. Because I have found that even if a dog knows a behavior really well, and you get a handler that has a diluted, frustrated relationship with the dog, and you're trying to give them some sort of pressure or correction for non-compliance on a behavior they know really well. Sometimes if you're using something that doesn't give them enough umph or doesn't give them enough consequence for non-compliance, they're just not gonna listen. Um, you get like a young puppy or a young dog on a leash, just like a young kid, you, hey, go to your room. They say, yeah, but I really wanna watch TV. And you go, well, okay then. And then they just kind of like tiptoe back to the TV and you go, eh, all right that's like the same equivalence to asking your dog to heal. And they're like, do I have to? And then they just pull right through. That's enabling them to allow them to do that. So those are the two things. I think making sure that your dog really, really, really knows the behavior that you're asking and you're at the right step in your training to take that step. Again, it's the same thing. So many dog owners come in and they're like, I, I just started to do heal or I just started to do sit, stay. And I turned around, I dropped the leash and I ran 50 feet away and my dog gets up every time. You have to incrementally get to those points. If you can't 
You got it. If I were to write a book, it would be three pages long. Take your time. Like that's what it would be. So many people are like, I want to introduce heel to my dog. So let's go downtown to the busiest environment. And I get it. Like people are like, well, this is realistic, but your dog doesn't fundamentally understand how to yield to leash pressure yet. They don't understand the equipment. They don't understand the pressure. They don't understand the behavior cue. They understand nothing. So you go, and it's like this conundrum of frustration matched with ignorance. And it's to nobody's fault, which is why I try to produce so much free content, for example, this for people, um, because it's that's what people do. They get frustrated because they don't put enough time into the foundation. So that would be that answer. I do have a follow-up question um, to that, Tom. Let's just say someone does find themselves in that scenario where they realized perhaps like maybe they're hitting the nick, the dog's just not getting it. Is, is it, are they better off rather than trying to like either, let's just say they don't have an e-call or like yank the dog because they're frustrated. Ah, the dog's not getting it in that point. Is it better to just be cool and collective? Let's, you know, maybe it's a reminder that I should just work on this at home or I notice a lot of people feel like they need to address it right then and there. Are they better off just kind of letting it go? Just let's just keep the walk going. Let's just go back home. Maybe this is something I need to just keep practicing at home. Um, yes. Yes. The answer is yes. I, I think that we forget that, you know, dogs are not robots. They're animals. They have feelings. They have emotions. They, they get frustrated. They get into funks. They get overwhelmed. They get like, oh crap, like we do when there's a bunch of pressure coming down on them. So I think, um, I think st stepping back and, and I do that often where a dog gets like too chaotic and I'm like, all right, why don't you break away for a couple of minutes and then we'll regroup. So, um, no, I, I don't think that anybody should be like, you don't, you don't fight, you don't fight, um, like non-compliance with fire. Like if a, like you have to be articulate and you have to be very, um, you know, when you're correcting a dog, like I, I think, I think it takes a, I mean, it takes a lot of responsibility to correct a dog because you got to be careful what you're correcting because it's developing in mind. It's developing, you know, just like with kids, right? If we're, it, we got to be careful, like what we say and how we say it, if we've had a bad day and we come home and a kid spills milk all over and we just take it out on them, it could be long-term affecting them on, on things. And so I think that it's in, you know, and that's, that's, that's our jobs as responsible uh, e-collar users and any other tool users is responsibility is key. Education is key. If, if your dog isn't doing what you want, um, that should make you a better handler. That should make you a better uh, e-collar user. If, if you're having problems, go back to the drawing board. And that's what I do time and time again um, with a lot of dogs is I say, okay, what's broken here? Like if I ask a dog to do it and they're not getting the picture, take a step back and figure it out. That doesn't mean you can't correct the dog if they are being opportunistic or they're just like, yeah, but, you know, but I think if you're getting, fr if, if you're frustrated and the dog's frustrated, put the dog away and restart. Yeah. I, I'm glad. And I'm glad to hear you say that. I feel like a lot of people needed to hear that because a lot of the questions, not only for the Zooms we do, I, I do with you, just in general, a lot of people are trying to like, I think, resolve a lot of problems in one moment in time. And I think right giving the um you know dog owners permission to say hey you know what it's okay you're not going to probably resolve it all right then and there but it, it, it maybe it's something you need to practice when you're at home it's not the end of the world yeah if you can't fix it yeah then and there yeah yeah take your time take your time take your time take your time and then like that's like that's like the devil's that's like the devil's lettuce you know type stuff for me is like i get out and and it's it's this and people are it, i just did a seminar right and I get all these dogs that I have never met before with a group of people from all over the country that I've also never met before. And, you know, it's like, I, I want people to understand like what, what I do, you know, with dogs, I think, I think dog owners are just like, they get, they, they exactly that is they're like, this is what I have to do. Like, this is, if it's not working right now. So just take your time. Like there's so many mistakes that are made by myself. And by every other, if any other dog trainer says that they don't make mistakes and they're perfect, chances are they're just lying to you. Like I make mistakes every day, but I also learn from those mistakes every day also. And so and that's like the beauty of working with dogs in general, not only as a professional, but just as a dog owner. I was a dog owner way before I was a professional, obviously. And so for me, 
every single time that I touch a leash or I touch a remote collar with the dog is an opportunity in a blank canvas to get better and to create something beautiful. And I think dog owners get so overwhelmed with this isn't working. Well, dog training sometimes takes years with one dog. Like sometimes it takes months and years and it's not an overnight thing. And it takes some people just, you know, don't. And I think just hiring a trainer in general, like I can't express to people how, how, how I guess valuable just a good dog trainer can be to you and your dog. I get hundreds of DMs and emails and phone calls and everything from people like, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. And I'm like, I can, I, I can consult with you like we are right now. And it's going to give people, you know, inspiration maybe to go out and work with their dog, but really hiring somebody to work with them in person is the best way to really start. Sometimes, you know, if you can find a good trainer. Um, so anyway, Let's move on to the next question. Um, I'm kind of gonna, I'm gonna piggyback on something someone just asked right now, and I think it's a good way. Um, so the next topic would be kind of like interactions with 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 humans, and kind of we're starting off here with leash pulling um, and leash aggression, um, and and this kind of has to do with Tanya's question here. Um, she wants to know with the e collar. She wants she wants to know if this can help with leash reactivity. So in her case, she's not sure when to use the e-collar if her dog's being leash reactive. She she needs to know, should she address what's really causing this leash reactivity before she introduces the e-collar? Um, or in what order should that kind of go in and how to address leash, leash reactivity in, in, in general? Yeah, um, yeah, yes is the answer. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think, when you're talking about leash reactivity, you got to have like a clear game plan on what you're trying to do. I'll give you a perfect example. Okay. A dog came in uh, today uh, with working with me privately with, with our out of state program. And this dog was uh, just a young, not a young, but a, 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 a this dog was a, it's a pit bull and she has been bred and she was adopted. And this dog, this guy has had this dog for about four months, but this dog is really having a hard time. This dog reacts like this. It goes straight up and then really just stays up here until you remove the dog. So this dog is really going up straight like this, right? Like react zero to a hundred. We're cool. We're cool. We're cool. Now we're not. And the dog owner was having a really hard time on the leash, correcting the dog. Two things, some dogs don't care about leash corrections, period. I don't care how good you are. And then more than likely dog owners or somebody who hasn't been professionally working with dogs for a long period of time have a hard time getting that pop. And, and if anybody out there is listening that has dog dogs or whatever, you guys know what I'm saying. Like that pop that you see a dog trainer do takes years of finessing and experience. There's a lot of mechanics that go on with that. So for an example, with this particular dog, the only thing we were missing was that, um, was getting that dog to come down faster. She came up and she stayed up here and she was reacting and growling and lunging for a while, like minutes. And so the dog owner was frustrated and maybe he didn't have the skills to, to do the correction um, or the patience. And you got to remember as a dog trainer, we never have enough time with the dogs. It doesn't matter if they're with us for six months or a year, there's always more that we want to do because we're grabbing gears as we go. And so when we have hours, five to 10 hours to develop a new relationship with the dog and get rid of behaviors we don't like, it's, it's, it's a crunch and you have to be resourceful and creative. And so in this case with the dog trip to ADC, what I did, like I've done in many cases that you guys may or may not have seen me do on my YouTube channel with these types of cases, is, is the, the only thing that was missing was disrupting that behavior and giving the dog an opportunity to intake information. The dog came up and couldn't come down. She's a sweet dog. She's a lovely dog. She just has this really bad reaction. So I switched up to the 280C and we used the pager, which is the vibrate, which I don't, rem which I don't recommend anybody doing without uh, uh, consulting a professional because the pager, and I say that the pager, is, 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 is just the vibrate for those of you who don't know. It's like your iPhone. It literally just goes like this. And so what happened was, is the dog reacted. We marked it verbally with a leave it. So leave it like this. And the dog 
90% of the time the dog goes, what the heck was that? And then as the dog was trying to figure out what the vibrate was, the dog that they were reacting to was continually moving around. So after they came down from what was that, they realized that the dog was still in front of them and it gave her an opportunity to t intake information to get over this reaction. So with that being said, um, you can use the e-collar to stop reactivity, but you have to be very careful how you do it because I typically, if I'm going to long-term use any type of stimulation with the dog for obedience training, um, and that's what I like to tell people. And actually, Lorraine, I don't know if I told you this, but I'm going out to Las Vegas to do a private, um, a private event for a dog training company to teach their, um, their dog training camp how to use the e-collar the e properly in, in oh, my methods. Yeah. We'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about that one. Uh, so, yeah. So I'm doing that next weekend. And, and one thing I've been working on with my content is I tell people that the e-collar in most cases, and, and again, guys, I'm not talking about competitiveness. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about in most dog owners cases, the dog's going to come in and you're going to go two ways with the e-collar. You're going to go, let's teach the dog how to communicate off leash using the stimulation on low levels. So we can then transfer to off leash work and tighten up some obedience, or we're going to use it as a behavior modification tool to make up for the lack of ability of the dog owner's ability to handle the dog that they have. Um, and so in this case, that's what we did is we used the 280C, the dog reacted, brrr, the dog went like this. And I, and I have probably 20 videos of successfully doing this with dogs who are really, really, really bad, really nasty. And it just gives the dog the ability to get over this curve of like, oh, sitting here and getting food for placing instead of reacting is much better. Um, and so you can use the e-collar for reactivity, but you don't want to correct the dog with the stimulation without context, especially if you're going to be using the e-collar stimulation in the future for other obedience things. Um, because the e-collar, and I, and I saw this question fly up, and again, I don't know who's here and how many people are here, but I see some questions coming in. One, one person asked the difference between the pager and the stimulation. The pager is just a vibrate with absolutely no variations of levels. It's just one and done. Um, and then the stimulation is uh, the stimulation that you would feel from the e-collar, usually ranging from zero to 127. So if you're going to long-term use obedience with the dog, with the stimulation, I would highly recommend not using that tool as an aversive or as a corrective tool, because it'll take away from the opportunity of the remarkableness, if you will, of using the off-leash tool with the stimulation. So you're not going to use obedience with the pager because the pager is like this, oh crap button of like the dog, what the heck? And it's just normally what you see me using that for is to bring dogs back down to reality, like bring them back down, bring them back down, right? It's like if you're having like this tantrum and somebody comes up and just says, hey, what are you doing? And they go, what? Me? And kind of snap them out of here. You pour water on somebody. It just disrupts this build. And then it, it gives them the opportunity to, to, to overcome some of their reactivity. Does that answer that question, Lorraine? I think it does. And I was about to answer, I was about to share another um, here and rather than typing all this, um, someone did just ask about kind of, um, we got two people asking questions about a prong, prong collars. Um, sounds like both of their dogs um, either one has a, a dog that's still like lunging, even with a prong collar, like it doesn't seem to, to bother this person's dog. And then the other thing I do want to address, and I see this often, um, you know, I haven't heard it happen all the time, but it can happen. I want to just give you everyone like just like a forewarning. Um, the e-collar has two contact points that are stainless steel. The prong collar is made out of, I believe, metal as well. In the event that you press your e-collar and the stem touches your prong collar, what you're going to cause could potentially happen is the stimulation could jump onto the prong collar and, and the stem could go all the way around. So you kind of, we always advise to avoid wearing both at the same time. Like 
you know, I know Tom works with Herm Spring. I have no problem with, if you guys want to rock prong collars, by all means do it. I just mean more so, I'm not telling you, oh, choose doctor over a prong collar. That's not my point. My point is be careful when you do that. Um, Pete actually uh, shared that information with me that it, 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 for just for safety issues, uh, if you're going to offer one, do one or the other, but not both at once because they could touch. And if you press the uh, stem, it could go all the way around. So just, just a little tip right there. And to ta uh, Tanya was just saying, I think it was Tanya, the dog is still lunging. Uh, she has a prong collar, but she will hurt herself pulling. She just doesn't seem to care. So she's human reactive. She's No, she's actually dog and human. Her dog is dog and human reactive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just uh, a couple things. Um, two things is, yeah, like when I'm wearing, like oftentimes the, the prong collar and the e-collar are two separate tools for two separate things, right? You show up to a job site with just a ruler and not a hammer and not a screwdriver and not a power drill. You're kind of SOL. So for me, both of those tools are going to mean two separate things and two different communications with the dog. So um, if I'm out with a dog and, and the other thing on to that point is the prong collar should always, I always put the prong collar high and tight and the, and the e-collar always goes low and that's also tight. So for a prong collar to get under an e-collar and conduct any type of stimulation means that one of those pieces of equipment was, was, was war, war wrong was wearing wrong. <laughs> um, so that's just my two cents on that, just because like I, I do use both of those tools all the time. Um, and then also Herm Springer in general, usually they have a bunch of different metals that some of them with nickel, some of them without nickel, some of them are softer metals and things like that. But, um, and then, so it, on that question of the prong collar, again, the prong collar doesn't work if the dog pulls against it. Um, on the, and I, and I, I, I have relentlessly and I won't stop and I'm not frustrated with it, but I will relentlessly put out videos to explain to people that once you pull against the prong collar, it does absolutely nothing. Um, it's just a safer collar to wear than a flat collar because it distributes pressure evenly and causes action, your ability to communicate with the dog versus collapse their trachea and just have their dog pull their way through town. Um, so I would say if your dog is pulling through the prong collar, it's only because you're not using it right and it's not fit properly. Um, that's 99% of the reasons why any dog would avoid um, or, or pull through a prong collar in general. What was the other, what was the second part of that, Lorraine? I think, it, let me scroll up here. So this was Tanya and she says, okay, so she's, her dog is dog and human reactive. She met a new dog on leash at first. She was hostile towards the dog. As soon as they met off, as soon as they met off leash, she was fine. She has a prong collar now, but she will hurt herself pulling. She doesn't seem to care. So that's kind of like the full, that was the full. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so again, the prong collar is used as like, you know, the pen itself isn't going to write my sentence for me just because, and I'm making this, I'm on the fly, but just because I take this pen and I do this doesn't mean it's going to start writing things for me. I have to use this pen accordingly to make the things that I want the communication, right? So the prong collar is the same exact way. Just because you put it on doesn't mean it's going to just stop your dog from pulling. The prong collar is a tool that you have to use um, just like any other tool we use. Just because it's on doesn't mean, just like with the e-collar, right? We put the e-collar on, we slap that sucker on, and we turn it on um, and you turn it up to a level that doesn't mean it, your dog is trained with it. So, and again, and I get it. And I'm not trying to say like, I'm just trying to say that I think the prong collar, a lot of people think that once it's on and the dog pulls, then they, they should stop and they don't like it. And that's not the case. That just, that doesn't usually do anything for the dog. You have to use the, and I, and again, I have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of videos on that. Yeah. Um, so I was just suggest for that person to check out my prong collar playlist on my, um, on my YouTube channel. Yeah. And we'll go with the last one. Cause you already kind of cup, uh, puppies was a topic, but I think you, you went really in depth, uh, in the beginning on that. So the last one we have, cause I see a couple people asking here about their shy and anxious dogs. Um, so I'll use Kay Hopkins, uh, comment as an example here, her rescue is terrified of people. 
um, what's the best way for her rescue dog or just any dog to build confidence around new people. Um, he's no longer fleeing. So I guess her dog used to flee from people, but he sometimes will, will growl or hide. Um, he's a tri triplet and I don't know his history. Uh, I guess he found him with a shattered knee. So um, I guess let's just kind of cover a little bit about anxious dogs, introducing dogs to humans, dogs who are very, uh, whether it's because they have bad experiences from the past with humans, or how do we get dogs to be confident again around humans? Um, well, I think, yeah, the, the, the biggest thing, okay, that I would tell people to help with confidence. So think about it from the point of view of the dog. Let's do that first. With confidence, you get a dog that's afraid of something. The last thing you want to do is then have a bunch of those things that they're afraid of come after them in their mind. So oftentimes, if you get a fearful dog, what people will do is they'll go out and they'll say, hey, I want everybody to come and meet my dog. And as your dog is literally, you know, shying away and, and trying to get away from the situation. So if you're going to bring your dog out to get used to new people, the absolute best thing to do is to have people and, and whoever's around um, ignore the dog. If they're fearful of something, help them overcome those fears by not making those fears a big deal. If we are, if our dog is afraid of the iPad thing, we're not going to say it's okay. It's just look, 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 look. You're going to say, Hey, here it is. I'm going to put it down. We're going to walk past it a billion times. It's not going to move. It's not going to come at you. It's just going to stay there. But oftentimes what people do is they get a dog that's insecure and we immediately say, it's okay. I'm just friendly. I'm super friendly back like this. And then the dog gets freaked out. So I think just in general, that's what everyone does. And I would just suggest if you're going to go out tell people, my dog is in training. Please don't look at him. Please don't talk to him. Bring them to places where it's not going to be pet smart. It's not going to be pet co. It's not going to be places that people are going to want to come up to your dog. Maybe go to um, like a, like an outdoor store, like a Home Depot or something and just work around people. Go out to an area that's very populated and stand way back and just get your dog acclimated to those things. But I think, again, it's just, it really comes down to having your dog be exposed to positive experiences with those things that they're fearful of and telling everybody around to just not look at your dog, no matter how many videos on dog training that they've watched and no matter how many dogs that they loved and they've rescued, um, dogs are fearful of people that they don't know in general uh, as a fearful dog. So through that's that, my- Through that method, Tom, over time, do you think people eventually make a breakthrough with their dog? Yes overcoming that fear? Yeah, I think so. I think, and again, it, you have to look at your, your expectation. There are certain dogs who, who never, ever, ever come out of their shell because they've been traumatically abused by people and they shouldn't ever come out of their shell because people abuse them. So you just have to look at the expectations and really think about your goals too. So if you have a fearful, you can't take every fearful dog that's afraid of things and every dog that's been rescued that is, is afraid of people and make them better. You can't, you want to, that's our goal, of course, but there's some dogs who are never going to get over these things. And it's your job that you can still live a great life, but you have to go out and really just be a good leader and advocate for your dog. Uh, that's important. Um, so I think having realistic expectations and advocacy for your dog is the best thing. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, I think I'm going to, we're going to wrap it up here. You guys, I see a couple more questions coming through, but you guys, I, 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 we all value Tom's time and stuff, but uh, you know, went a little bit over here. So I do thank you, Tom, for, for all your time. You guys, Welcome. we got a lot of questions going on. So um, do connect with Tom or connect with Upstate Canine Academy. Um, so that's another great resource for you guys to reach out to Tom and uh, go over this in a little bit more detail. Um, some of you guys have more specific questions. Um, so I do recommend reaching out to one of Tom's trainers or a, a trainer in your area um, to kind of go a little bit more in depth into that. And um, that is basically it, you guys. Um, this video was recorded. So uh, we're going to work on putting it up on our .com. And people are asking you to go to San Diego and to Oregon. <laughs> so um, so hopefully, you know, Tom's, Tom's U.S. tour comes soon. Yeah. 
It's coming. All right. All right thanks, guys. All right, you guys. Thanks, be sure to check out Tom's new uh, hoodies and all his swag and stuff. I, I absolutely was dying of laughter. Steve saw me dying of laughter at the old lady helping the dog cross the street. Oh, yep. my God. Uh, Second chances. No out, bad dogs. Check out all his stuff. Thanks again, Tom. And uh, All right, guys. Thanks. We'll touch base soon. All right. Take, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.